We're going to uh, kind of talk about how to gather data, analyze it at scale, maybe with a little bit of thought behind it, with kind of hypothesis generation for hunting. Um, I'm Jared Atkinson. I'm the Adversary Detection Technical Lead at Spectre Ops. I uh, used to work for the U.S. Air Force. Um, also, was part of Veris Group's Adaptive Threat Division. I do a lot of development on my, in my spare time, so I wrote Power Forensics, which is a C-sharp slash PowerShell uh, forensic framework. Also did uh, ACE, which we released at Black Hat Arsenal uh, this past year. I'm also a PowerShell MVP from Microsoft. Hi, so I'm Robbie Winchester. I am the Adversary Detection Lead at Spectre Ops. Um, I co-authored ACE with Jared that we released at Black Hat, and then I worked on a hunting Elasticsearch uh, log stash cabana that uh, Roberto Rodriguez, Cyberdog, wrote. Uh, I also was former Air Force and worked at Veris Group Adaptive Threat Division as well. So, into the meat of it. Um, we're going to start off and talk about, first, what is hunting in general, because there's a lot of different definitions, so how we view it. Go into attacker TTP, uh, that is tactics, techniques, and procedures, and then how to create useful hypotheses. So the first half of this talk basically is going to be kind of going over that structure. And then the second half, Jared is going to walk through using this process to search for and detect golden tickets in your environment and how you can do that kind of from a cradle to grave. So what is hunt? Uh, there's a lot of definitions. Our perspective is the active searching for an ongoing compromise malicious activity in your environment that has evaded the current defenses you have in place. So a lot of, basically every environment has some sort of network defense solution or applications in place. Uh, hunting is going and looking beyond what those are already alerting for to try and find that adversary or malicious person that has evaded that. Uh, rooted in assume breach mindset. Uh, Mark Rosinovich has talked about that as well. Basically that your, your system is not invulnerable, your environment is not invulnerable, and you should plan on a breach occurring and plan for that, not plan on never being compromised. So that's kind of the, the perspective we're coming at this, this hunt thing. So generically, what does, what does hunt normally look like? Typically, at an early infancy stage, what we've seen is there's kind of two phases, the gathered data, where you're taking as much data as you can, all the network data and host data, uh, all the tools that you can purchase, and you're putting those somewhere, normally a sim, and then within that you're hunting for bad, um, which can be anything from anomalous anomalies, things that are weird, the latest thing you saw tweeted. So what are the problems with this? You, What data are you collecting, first of all? Why are you collecting that data? What's the purpose behind it? Uh, Elk or Splunk is expensive if you're collecting literally everything in your environment, so cost could be an issue. Uh, Elk is technically free, but if any of you have actually set up Elk, once you start getting at scale, it takes time, which is not free. Um, and then hunting for bad, what are the problems there? So what are you looking for in that data? Because if you have a million records and you pull up a sim and you decide, I want to find something bad, that's a really bad place to start. It's an overwhelming amount of data. Um, also, what is good and what is the normal baseline for your environment, which that changes and is different? And how much time are you going to be spending searching through this data before you're ingesting more data? So what's, is your cycle of analysis even keeping up with this ever-increasing flow of data? So that's kind of the starting place. The next step, and this is where we're kind of advocating, and uh, there's other programs that advocate this as well, uh, is hypothesis-driven. So rather than just getting data and looking for bad, start with a hypothesis or this concept of what you want to try and find, which is what we're going to talk about in this talk, and then gather data for that hypothesis. So have targeted data collection that has a purpose, and then within that targeted data, hunt for the bad that you've identified in your hypothesis. So you're looking for something specific rather than just a general threat. So what are those benefits? Uh, you're going to focus your data collection. A lot of times we will go into an environment as consultants and data collection for data collection's sake is occurring and there'll be uh, hundreds of gigs a day of logs going into a sim of different sorts, um, but there's literally no one doing anything other than paying the Splunk or whatever bill. They're just, they're having all of it come in and they're proud of the amount of data that's being ingested, but then the actual analysis of that or understanding of all of the implications of that data is, is missing because it's a tough problem. Uh, you're going to have a specific goal. So rather than just finding bad, you're going to have a targeted thing you're trying to shoot for. And then it helps to eliminate that analysis paralysis. So if I am looking for malicious activity X, 
I am opening up the sim, I'm digging into the data, I'm collecting data for a reason. I am not just trying to find everything all at once. Um, so you, you don't get this over sense of overwhelming and being defeated. Uh, we like to think of it like the, you, you, if you eat an elephant, how do you do it? One bite at a time. You, if you try and eat the whole elephant, you're going to have a bad time. It's going to be overwhelming. So just start taking those bites, doing those hypotheses, and over time, you can look back and realize how much progress you've made. Um, and then with that, this allows you to track those hypotheses and have a structure. So over time, you know what you have been looking at, and you can kind of have a progress of what you have been doing and what you haven't. Okay, cool. Hopefully now everyone is sold. How do I make a hypothesis? Because that's very vague. And this is kind of the problem that we faced uh, when we were doing our hunting and trying to, to define it is making a hypothesis is really not specific enough to provide a meaningful path or approach for someone to take. So we're going to walk through our process of hunt hypotheses and then Jared is going to take over at the end and do a walkthrough of a case study using this process for how he kind of cradled a grave, looked for golden tickets in an environment. So take a little step back. What are we looking for? So we said assume breach, attacks happen, compromise happens. Every conference you can choose a different thing, like Equifax is obviously the name of the day now, but it's not a matter of when you are breached, it's a matter or if, of if, it's a matter of when. So if you are if you have anything of value and are targeted, eventually it is very likely someone will be successful because it's harder to be right all the time than it is to be right once. Um, in general, we also try and focus our hunt activities on post-exploitation. That's because, for the most part, a lot of the in-place defenses are trying to prevent or detect that initial phase of compromise and that just initial access. And so we try and focus on the post-exploitation um, persistence and lateral movement type activities uh, because that is still part of the attack chain, which we'll talk about in a bit. And as long as you can sever that attack path, attack chain, before they've completed their objective, there's there's really not a big difference from a result of if you did it at the very beginning within seconds and if you did it at the later on in that path. So we're just trying to make sure they don't get their objective. So like I said, uh, a lot of MITRE is super helpful. Um, if you have never referenced their resources, uh, we're going to reference a lot of that in this talk. Um, so this is their cyber attack lifecycle. You've probably seen something along these lines, uh, hacker methodology, all those types of things. So basically flowing from left to right is kind of the general process that is occurring when you are going to attack or any kind of malicious activity is going to go on. So you can have some kind of recon, uh, weaponize, deliver something, do some kind of exploitation potentially. And then those three areas to the right, the control, execute, maintain, that's where we're really focusing and where the MITRE attack framework focuses. And so if you can see kind of those areas, uh, those tactics on the right side, uh, we're going to talk more about those coming up next. So the MITRE attack framework is a body of knowledge, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it's basically a reference for offense and defense. It covers a bunch of different types of uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac OS uh, tactics and techniques. Um, it's updated regularly. The categories are are referencing a lot of those kind of attack cycle things, um, and the attack guys are, are really good about continuing to update this on a fairly regular basis uh, and make changes and also uh, are, are very active in the community. So it's, it's a really good resource. I have the, the link here, and I think it's also going to be included at the end for all the links so that it's a, a one easy picture to get. Um, so here's what that looks like, and I realize that no one is going to be able to actually see this. So it's an eye chart. The point is there's a lot of stuff, like a ton. And every one of those is actually a hyperlink, and so when you click on it, you get even more information about it. So why does this matter? What is this? So here's kind of the breakdown. Uh, we're both prior Air Force, so we'll hear TTP used a lot. For us, that means tactics, techniques, and procedures, which in the military has kind of a specific terminology. A lot of times you'll see tools or processes or programs or other things. Um, but for our purposes, tactics and techniques and procedures uh, lets us kind of break down and structure our hypothesis later related to MITRE. So those column headers across the top represent the tactics, which are the kind of high level, just general concepts of the types of things that are going on. So you have the, the tactical level of what are you looking at generally. And then as you go into each of those individual fields, the individual boxes, those are the techniques, which are the non-prescriptive, not specific instruction, just kind of what is the task or method that is being utilized. And so you have your tactics, you have your techniques, and then, uh, yeah, so right now there's about 217. 
Uh, they're, they're adding more. So there's a lot of techniques currently there. Um, if you were to click on one of those, for example, process hollowing, then you would pull up this breakdown, which is going to describe it more. And then inside of that, they'll have examples for a lot of these, which is going to have uh, references to threat, threat intelligence, specific other um, examples of command lines and arguments and code and things that are used. So that's the procedural level, which is the detailed instructions. So that's where kind of like the hash matching and a lot of that very uh, consumed threat intel that goes into a matching situation is going to be that procedural level. So that's kind of the, the background of the attack matrix, which leads us to why is this, why do we care? Why do we make that tangent? We really think it's important to focus on that behavioral technique level rather than looking at the specific tools, signatures, hashes, all that kind of stuff. Command lines can change, C2 IPs can change, but the, the behaviors are really hard to change and the types of activities from behavioral level um, are tough and are very consistent typically to a, like a threat actor um, or malicious, whatever APT you're going up against. So in the context of the attack matrix, the techniques are that kind of behavioral level. So if you're focusing on how can I detect this type of technique, uh, rather than how can I detect this specific tool being executed with these command line arguments, you're going to have a lot more resilient detection. Um, it also functions as a really good reference for, like as you're going through that hunt hypothesis process, you can reference the attack matrix for potentially what you want to go into next. You can track on that where you have been doing hunting and what things you've done in the past and what things you want to do in the future in a way that is pretty is easily visual and you can then relay to like upper management, which is important, uh, unless you are a manager and then congratulations. Um, and planning for future activity. So with that, if you're tracking what you've done in the past, you can also plan where you want to go in the future, um, specifically if you're lacking coverage. So a lot of times we will, uh, something that is is common for us to, to recommend looking for first is persistence because by definition it's going to put stuff somewhere for a long time. Um, but if you realize that you have spent weeks and weeks looking at persistence and have never looked at anything about, you know, credential theft, then that's maybe an area that is worth looking into. And this quantifies that so you can kind of put that down and, and identify that. So now enter the hunt hypothesis. Um, this is now we're going to take all that information and talk about our Five-step process to make a meaningful hunt hypothesis that you can use to hunt your environment. So first is identify the tactic and technique, identify the procedures, identify the collection requirements, the scope, and then document the excluded factors. Uh, in general, also, we recommend that you design these hypotheses to take a week. Uh, that's because it makes it that bite-sized chunk, and so rather than having an impossible feat, everything is, is designed with the intention of being achievable. Uh, and we'll get into that more when we talk scope. So identify the tactic and technique. This is the high level. You're just pointing yourself in the right direction. Most, if not all, types of attacks involve are going to involve multiple different tactic, tactics and techniques. And so what we recommend is focusing on one. Because at the end of the day, if you can at least go and narrow it down to a single technique on that attack matrix, that you will definitively go and check off that I feel comfortable that we've covered this in our environment, you you know that that is no longer a threat. And so it's better to cover one thing thoroughly rather than go kind of broad brush strokes over and potentially miss all of those important aspects um, if you're trying to kind of do too much. And so again, you, you can also do that tracking because those tactical level, it's broken down into 10 tactics. You can kind of make sure you're spreading out accordingly to, according to risk or trends you're seeing in like threat reports. Um, so identifying the procedures. So now we've kind of figured out the direction we want to go. This is, okay, what, how are we actually getting there? What are the steps along the way? So this is where you're going to find those specific examples, dig in, start to understand what is that technique? What does it mean? What are, um, what are those like APT, threat intelligence, whatever kind of got you interested in that? How, how is this technique being used? And ideally understanding the similarities across different things. So if, if it is a single tool is consistent across all of the different attacks that you see, all of the different threat reports, like that's something worth noting. Um, behaviorally, just kind of taking note of what is the same um, and what can't be changed. What are limitations based on, you know, the operating systems that they're operating on um, that, that are tough 
to change in those procedures so you can research and understand what's going on. So now you've gone from just kind of a general, I want to look at this broad thing to here's the specifics of how an attacker is using it that I want to be able to discover. Then finally, uh, kind of this is the, the bulk of your research is the collection requirements. And so how we view this is this is the phase where you're going to go and be demoing and doing everything in your lab. You want to pull down those samples if you can get them. You want to figure out why they're doing what they're doing uh, and, and what the different effects are. A, a lot of times there may, especially if people are using defaults, which happens a lot, there may be things that are not very well documented or that is not well known that if you're really focusing down on something and looking for all of the types of behaviors, uh, you're going to be able to detect that. Additionally, and this is very important, uh, in any environment, Every environment is unique, and the specific set of crazy circumstances that has caused that network to be the way it is, is unique. And so while there are things that should be and are standard, um, every network we have ever gone into has been different in some way. And so it's important to identify for your specific network not just what the false positives are on a normal system, like a stock Windows system, for example, but on one of your own. So like, get a gold disk system if you have that and test it there and see what is different. And then ideally test against a small representative portion of your network so you can figure out what is normal and help your detection be a lot easier later on. So at the end of this, you should have ideally a POC that's going to gather the data you need to find this activity. So phase four, identify the scope. Um, the time, depending on what you're doing and depending on the research for the collection requirements, the time it may take to do this, uh, you could have more or less. We recommend a week just because then it lets you kind of shape everything else around that and at the end of every week have something that you've accomplished. Um, the number of data sources you can collect. So depending on if your data source is already from a pre-existing agent, if you're doing some new agentless scanning technique, you're pulling data with like PowerShell. Um, if you're pulling network data, how many different subdomains and network appliances you have. A lot of those factors, you need to take into account the amount of time that you have and how much data you're getting so that you can accurately scope down so you're having that, those realistic goals. Um, and it's fine if you can't do everything because, again, the benefit of owning a network is that it's yours and you have time. And so as long as you're progressively increasing that security, you're making it more secure. So rather than try and rush and do everything poorly, we'd recommend doing it right in incremental steps and then grow that quality defense. Um, and you also may be limited by... You may go through all this and realize that you don't have the technical capability to collect the data, and that's fine. That's why we have document, document excluded factors. So what things could you not include at every level? And this is the most important from a program development going forward. Uh, what TTPs were you not able to do that were in that? Because there's a lot that weren't included. So if you want to go and catch everything for that specific threat, what else do you need to look at? Uh, what are your technical limitations? That's great for driving future tool purchasing. So if you're going and talking to a vendor, rather than saying, this looks really cool, I like the graph, you can ask, do you have the ability to collect any of this set of data that we're currently lacking? And that's going to be helpful in searching for and acquiring uh, new, new like tools, basically. Um, political limitations, a lot of times they'll have production systems, systems you can't touch. Uh, if you can go and identify that the scope, these are off limits time and time and time again, that lets you document that, you know, we've assessed the rest of the network except for these systems that now could be vulnerable to this whole set of things. So as long as you're willing to sign off on this growing list of stuff, it's not my call. Um, and then this is all going to feed those future hunt hypotheses and this, like the scope limitations again is kind of included in all of that. So what do we have at the end of this? Ideally, you have your specific behavior you're looking for. You understand why they're doing what they're doing and what the things that are going to be left behind are. And you know that data that you need to get in order to do that. So very specific goal. Uh, so kind of in general, before we get to the case study, what's the benefit of this? The big things for us is that it focuses on a tangible result. At the end of this week, ideally, you can check a box and say, yes, I actually feel comfortable that I've done this thing, I've done this task, and I am comfortable that this subset of information is not in my environment. Uh, you're going to incrementally improve over time. So rather than trying to do everything and, and maybe kind of staying at the same level of being overwhelmed, you're slowly increasing and raising that bar. And then also, uh, one of the big benefits is 
if you go through and you do this and you integrate all of this back into your automated alerting, uh, when a new threat intelligence report or attack report, whatever, APT comes out, if you can go through and look at it and see, oh, okay, these techniques I know I've looked at and I've looked at these types of things and based on the detections that I've done that I have documented, we would have seen this type of activity. So you can actually have a, a little bit more of a warm fuzzy saying, I don't have evidence that this occurred in our network. Um, so that is the overview of kind of the process that we're going to go through. So now Jared is going to take over and walk through what that's actually going to look like in a real environment. Cool. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, so who here went to Andy Rohan and Harm Joy's talk earlier today? A few hands. Uh, I'll ask Andy, what was the thing at the end of the attack path in your demo that you, that you were getting? Oh, yeah. yeah. This was not, this was actually not planned. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow, that's that's pretty convenient for this case study, and we'll see why here in a bit. But uh, again, we did not plan that. Um, and so the case study is going to focus on a notional or fake uh, fake company, I guess, and their hunt program. So imagine Robbie and I are the uh, the two hunters at this company. Um, so our CISO went to Black Hat, and he saw this this advertisement. Uh, not hey. You know, marketers will be marketers. I can't, you know, it is what it is. Um, and so he came back and he said, hey, uh, Carbon Black stops Mimi Cats. Can, uh, can we stop Mimi Cats? And, uh, and so to understand, like, that, that's a really basic question, right? Um, but to really understand what's going on and all the nuance of that question, you have to understand kind of what our situation is. So we're a, a relatively sized company, a small sized company. We have a sm very small security budget, which means we don't have any EDR products, um, no agent-based monitoring. Um, we have really poor lateral visibility, so like we can't see host-to-host -host communication. We don't have like any sensors down in that region of the network. Um, and we have lots of local admins. And by lots, I mean literally every user on every computer is a local admin. They need um, it. Yep, they need it. Yeah, it's just for business use, I think. Um, <laughs> yep, yep. And so, uh, so when he asked, can we detect carbon black, there's a couple, uh, there's a couple like inherent questions that he's really asking. Um, one is, can we detect Mimi Cats? And I said Carbon Black a few seconds ago, I meant Mimi Cats. Can we detect Mimi Cats? Can we stop it if we detect it? Um, and have we been affected by it, right? That's really what he's trying to get at. And so our reality is, he, he sees Mimi Cats, but really he wants to know, can we stop the things that Mimi Cats is ultima that's ultimately doing, right? And so that's where this hypothesis kind of concept comes into play. And so, uh, Mimi Cats, if you just look at it from a general perspective, everybody thinks that it's a password dumper, right? It dumps, dumps clear text passwords. Um, but ultimately there's tons of things that, that Mimi Cats ultimately does. And so from the, from the tactic perspective, tactical perspective, we're looking at credential access and lateral movement. And from the technique level, we're looking at credential dumping, right? Domain or local credentials, account manipulation, security support providers. So that's, uh, like a LSAS, uh, SSP being able to like interpret passwords or kind of man in the middle of the passwords, uh, pass the ticket attacks and pass the hash attacks, right? And so, like Robbie mentioned, we're not going to just say, okay, let's go out and try to detect all of that because if we try to do that, we're going to do it very poorly, right? So what we're going to do is break it into a kind of an iterative process where we pick one of those te techniques and then we figure that out kind of all the way and then we can move on and start to build our program, maybe move on to credential, credential dumping next, right? Um, and so, the one that, and again, we did not plan this, the one that I'm focused on for this, this talk is lateral movement uh, past the ticket, right? So lateral movement is the mechanism for which somebody moves from one system to another system. And then past the ticket is being uh, basically using Kerberos tickets uh, to access resources on the network when you don't have the actual password. All right, so uh, in order to kind of uh, get everybody up to speed, we'll talk about Kerberos, and this is going to be a really, really fast talk. Um, so imagine that I am Jared logging into the user workstation there, right? Um, and ultimately, I want to access Windows Remote Management or PowerShell remoting on the application server to the right. Um, so what actually happens in like domain authentication? Well, first, when I log in, I'm going to request, is a Kerberos session, right? So I'm logging into the domain. I'm going to request uh, a ticket granting ticket from the domain controller. That's uh, that AS rec and AS rep. So the domain controller is going to authenticate that I am who I say I am, and then they're going to give me the TGT. Um, then I'm going to try to connect to WinRM on the application server, but in order to do that, I have to get a service ticket for WinRM specifically on that system, and that's where this TGS rec 
comes into play. So I'm going to present my TGT, ticket granting ticket, to the domain controller and say, hey, I would like to access WinRM on the application server. And it's going to say, okay, this ticket granting ticket is valid. You're allowed to access that. Here's your, your service ticket, or uh, TGS, a lot of people call them. Um, then I'm going to present that TGS to the application server. It's going to auth authenticate that, and then it's going to allow me to access Windows Remote Management. All right, so that's generally generally how Kerberos works. Um, now, there's a couple ways that we can we can mess with Kerberos. One of them is through golden tickets, and that's where we forge the ticket granting ticket, right? So we're going to we get access to the KRB TGT hash, um, and then we're able to create our own golden ticket, saying we are whomever we we want to be, right? So we could be the enterprise admin, we could be a domain admin. I could be myself, but give myself enterprise admin access. And then that allows me to uh, request legitimate service tickets for anything that I want to request service tickets for. Another attack would be uh, the silver ticket, which is a forged service ticket. So uh, basically, I want to access WinRM on the application server. And, uh, and instead of you know, doing the TGT, then getting the, uh, the service ticket, I, just, uh, I get the account or service hash for the service or uh, computer, computer system that I want to access, and I'm able to create a forged service ticket for the service that I want to access without ever talking to the domain controller at all, right? And then I could go straight to the application server, gain access, and, uh, and do what I need to do there. Um, all these pictures, by the way, are from uh, Sean Metcalf's blog. I stole them with his permission. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you want some more information, check out that webpage, and it's going to go into much more detail than what I'm talking about uh, right now. All right, so uh, we've kind of identified uh, we want to talk about pass the ticket. And so when we go down into the procedural level, there's actually more than one procedure that pass the ticket kind of covers. So we talked about golden and silver tickets. Again, golden tickets are forged ticket granting tickets, and those allow me to request uh, ser legitimate service tickets to any service I want on the network, thus being able to access any system with uh, over like uh, SMB, WinRM, uh, Web, SQL, whatever it is. Um, and to do this, I need the KRB TGT account hash. Um, then you also have silver tickets, which are forged ticket granting service tickets, or service tickets as they're, they're also known. And that allows me to access specific network resources on specific systems. Um, and for this, you need the computer or service account hash. Now, uh, I, we're going to focus in even deeper on golden tickets specifically. Um, one of the reasons why is golden tickets allow you like access to whatever you want. Service tickets are a little more specific, and so just generally wanted to focus on golden tickets first. Um, a common kill chain, kind of, kind of what Andy, Andy and Rohan and Will showed in their presentation is, let's say I, I fish into a network, uh, in, in our network, you fish in, you get local admin access, right, because everybody's a local admin. Um, so you don't even, you can kind of skip the privilege escalation step. Um, you're going to dump credentials, maybe get a domain admin's account, you DC sync. Uh, then you can create a golden ticket. Then you get a legitimate service ticket. You laterally move to wherever you want to go. You, you gra gather some documents. You exfil them, kind of move on your merry way. So that's kind of the thought process of something that we're trying to stop. All right, so collection requirements. What... What do we actually need to do in order to detect this type of activity, right? What type of information do we need? What do we need to understand about the attack? And so for this, uh, Mimikatz is kind of the de facto golden ticket making tool, right? Um, we don't want to focus specifically on what Mimikatz does, but we're going to use that to kind of like demonstrate and test some of our theories. Um, the, the relevant data that we need to collect are logon sessions, um, so users that are logged on to systems, and then ticket granting tickets, which are associated with those logon sessions. And we'll, we'll kind of go through some of the different detections that you might come about. So, so one of the, the very first things that you might look at when you're looking for golden tickets is the ticket lifetime. By default on Windows operating system, uh, ticket granting tickets are, or, uh, yeah, ticket granting tickets are valid for 10 hours, right? Um, Mimikatz, they want, they want you to have access, uh, for as long as possible, so they default it to 10 years. Um, the, you could set this, so like your environment may not actually be the default 10 hours, it probably is, um, but you could actually set this via GPO, um, and down at the bottom you can see kind of where you would set that setting, um, but generally speaking, you want to look for tickets that are approximately uh, valid for 10 hours, right? And so in real life, 10 hours, it's going to be like 9 hours, 8 hours, 11 hours, but if something's valid for 10 years or something significantly longer than 10 hours, then it might be worth looking into. And so, generally speaking, we're looking for tickets. Legitimate tickets would have a lifetime of approximately 10 hours. Anything else is worth investigating. 
All right, so similarly, we have a renewal lifetime. So my ticket's valid for 10 hours, but then I can just renew that ticket. And how long am I allowed to do that for? Well, by default, it's seven days. And it can be set up to 99,999 days uh, if you want to. MimiCats, again, uh, defaults to 10 years. And so uh, you could check what your default domain policy is here at this uh, this group policy uh, location and uh, and kind of figure it out. But in our general domain, we're looking for seven days, right? All right, so then uh, this one this one's a little bit of a better, less less uh, specific uh, type detection, and so uh, this would be the encryption type of the ticket. So portions of the actual ticket itself are going to be encrypted, and uh, the encryption type is based on a couple factors. I, I say two here, but there there may be a couple more. Uh, one is the domain functional level of your actual domain itself, and so modern domains are going to be using AES encryption, and uh, kind of legacy domains will be using RC4. And also the hash type uh, that you're using to create the ticket. And so, Andy, what type of hash did you say? NT hash. So he grabbed the NT hash in his demonstration, right? And so uh, what we'll see here down at the bottom, you'll see that if you use the NT hash, NTLM hash, to uh, create the ticket, then you're going to create or use RC4 encryption, right? And so uh, if an attacker uses an NTLM hash to create a golden ticket, they would create an RC4 uh, ticket. Also, uh, we we went we ran with this and we're like, okay, if it's RC4, it's definitely bad, right? So we went to a customer environment. They had 10,000 computers. We ran we ran a collection. We we gathered all the tickets and we're like, anything RC4 is definitely a golden ticket, 100% bad. And we had like a thousand RC4 tickets and we're like, oh man, <laughs> this is not good, right? Um, so then I talked to uh, Sean Metcalf and he he uh, helped me figure out that. Interforest and interdomain tickets. So for backwards compatibility, if a if I create a ticket for a foreign domain or foreign forest, uh, it doesn't know necessarily what domain functional level that forest or domain is using, and so it's going to default to R, uh, RC4 encryption for backwards compatibility. Uh, okay. Yep. And so the encryption type that we're looking for is AES256, all that all that stuff, right? So that's the like technical name of the encryption type. All right, so, and then the most, the most behavioral detection that we could possibly come up with, um, which is also probably the most nuanced when that's kind of how it goes with behavioral detections, I guess, is a uh, logon session, the user that owns the logon session versus the client of the actual ticket itself. So, for instance, I log into a system as Jared. I request a ticket from the domain. I'm probably going to request it on behalf of Jared, right? Because that's, that's how that works. Um, if, if there is a logon session, for instance, that is uh, Jared and it's asking for Robbie admin and it has a ticket for Robbie admin, there may be something that we're we're interested in looking at, right? So, um, generally speaking, every logon session that is interacting with Kerberos, and so you may think, oh, if the authentication type is Kerberos, then it's going to have a Kerberos ticket. No, if it's ever if it's ever dealt with Kerberos in general, then it will have a uh, a ticket granting ticket associated with that logon session. Um, and so the, generally speaking, the TGT client should be the same as the logon session owner. Um, a, a good exception for that is like run as slash net only. And that's where you're creating a logon session where when you do network authentication, you're authenticating on behalf of a, a separate user. And that will have a, that user's ticket, but the original users as the session owner. And so here's, here's an example of a ticket that I pulled. This is a legitimate ticket. Notice at the bottom the session username is Matt Nelson DA, and the client name at the top for the for the ticket itself is Matt Nelson DA. So that's kind of what we're looking for. That's the normal activity. Anything that is different than that at least warrants a little bit of an investigation. All right. So going through that, we've kind of expanded our collection requirements to we want to look at logon sessions, specifically usernames, user principal names, the logon ID, which might be beneficial later on. Um, the logon type and the authentication package. Is it Kerberos? Is it an NTLM uh, logon session? We also want to look at the TGTs themselves in the logon session. So uh, make sure that it's a KRB TGT ticket. That means that it would be a golden ticket, quote unquote, or golden tickets are always TGTs. Um, then we want to look at the ticket client and domain. So who who is this ticket valid for? And then we want to look at the start and end time of the ticket, the renew until time, and the encryption type. All right, so uh, this demo is uh, thanks to Sean Metcalf. I kind of stole some of his golden ticket uh, commands. Um, but generally speaking, here's what we're doing. So it's not super clear, but we have Mimi Cats. 
And then we're going to use the golden, the Kerberos golden module. And we're going to create a ticket for a user called Darth Vader in uh, lab.adsecurity.org. And then we're going to use the slash PTT um, parameter, which basically applies that ticket to our current session. So it's going to zoom in here in a second. All right, so now I have this script which I wrote called get Kerberos ticket granting ticket. And that's going to pull all the ticket granting tickets from uh, all the sessions on the system. And we're able to kind of go through and look at things. Here we see the uh, session key is RC4HMAC. Remember, that was one of our detections. We also see that the end time is 10 years after the start time, another, another detection. And we see that the session is the user tester, local user tester, but we're, uh, we have a ticket for Darth Vader. And so I'm a pretty big fan of like uh, unit testing. And so I wrote kind of a unit testing uh, deal that allows me to compare a ticket against a bunch of rules, right? And so um, generally speaking, what we're doing is we're running each ticket through a series of tests, and then it's going to pop up red if it, if it failed the test, as in it's, it's possibly malicious. Um, and it's going to turn green if it's if it's good. So this is an example of a default Mimikatz golden ticket um, popping up as red all across the board, right? And so uh, more than it's 10 years valid, um, 10 years renew, it's RC4, so on and so forth. Um, one of the reasons why you don't want to be super specific to what like a specific tool does is because there may be ways to go around it. And so again, Mimikatz, we're doing pretty much the same thing. Ticket for Darth Vader. Here I ha I'm setting the end time to 600 minutes, which is 10 days, or 10 hours, I mean. And the uh, renew max to like 10,080, which is seven days. And so I've submitted that to my current session, kind of going through the same thing. But this time the attacker was a little bit cleaner in what they were doing. And so when we run that, uh, we again have Darth Vader in the tester's logon session. So that's, that's that kind of behavioral detection. But we have the right time frame, right? So the log, the start time to the end time is all correct. It's 10 hours and the renew time is seven days. Um, but we also still have that RC4 HMAC, uh, encryption type. Uh, it is possible via Mimikatz to, uh, change the encryption type as well. So here, uh, just showing we, the attacker was able to, you know, pass two of our tests, but they're still kind of a defense in depth kind of mentality. We have multiple detections that we're testing for and they have to match everything to, to be perfectly forged or a perfect, uh, perfect attack. All right. All right, so uh, next we want to, uh, we've kind of identified what stuff we need to collect, how we're going to detect kind of an attack, and so we want to identify our scope. So uh, again, we have one week of execution, as Robbie kind of mentioned. Our environment as a company is we have three domains, one Linux computer, which is non-domain joined, um, 12 Windows computers, which is a really big environment. Um, no sensitive production systems, so there's nothing that we had to like specifically stay away from. But unfortunately, we were able to get the creds for one of the domains, and so we are, we are only running against uh, two of the domains, which is seven seven computers. And so, uh, kind of finishing out, we want to uh, do phase five, which is document the excluded factors. We didn't look at credential theft attacks. Uh, lateral movement, we looked at golden tickets, but we're, we're looking at the kind of local ticket cache. So what tickets are currently on the system? Um, really, we want to look, we would want to also look at like event logs, network traffic, maybe Kerberos tickets on Linux systems, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're not looking at silver tickets or past the hash. And then for scope, we lacked credentials to the Linux system and the third domain, so we weren't able to scan those. Just for in the future, maybe we use this to try to get leverage to get those credentials, for example. All right, so let's do this against those seven systems, right? So now we're in prod. Here's my WinRM session on all, all seven of those systems. I'm going to use PowerShell's invoke command to run a script on, on those seven systems. All right. It's always way slower typing when uh, when you're on stage, I guess. All right, it seemed fast when I was practicing. All right, so uh, we had 43 total tickets. And then here's an example of one of the tickets. This is actually, so we were doing this in a red team training class that we held, and uh, this is actually a malicious ticket of uh, somebody that was impersonating the MicroWrite admin user. Um, so it's kind of funny that that one happened to be malicious, but was not a golden ticket per se. All right, so. Now I'm going to run all 43 tickets against that, uh, that unit testing script that I have. And so, like, for instance, here's one that, uh, one ticket that failed one of my checks. And so, uh, in this training lab, there's a bunch of user simulation. And so this just happened to be Harmjoy wrote the user simulation and everything he does is malicious. So it just happened to kind of, <laughs> kind of do that. Here's an example of a legitimate ticket, right? So it passed, passed with flying colors, all green on all the unit tests. And you'll see, 
there's a there's a number of legitimate tickets. Here's another user simulation. And so even though this one only like came up with red on two two of the checks, I still went back and like checked and made sure that this was you know ex able to be explained, right? And so in in real life, you're going to have situations like that. And so here's here's a ticket that failed four or five of the six tests. And so uh, we'll notice we have RC4 encryption. We have uh, that 10 year 10 year gap there for the uh, validity of the ticket itself. And we also have uh, a local admin user who has a ticket for the Matt Nelson DA account, right? And so um, that that just looks suspicious in general. So based on the names, names of the users themselves, we kind of conclude that somebody's going from a local admin all the way to a domain admin, right? And so kind of interesting from that perspective. All right. And so uh, kind of going forward for future developments, obviously silver tickets are going to have a lot of the similar similar type of uh, deals going on as golden tickets. And so things like the encryption type, the validity of tickets, the lifetime, the renewal window. Um, and so kind of moving forward into silver ticket type research. We also have, uh, I, as I was kind of going through this, I was also comparing my script to K-List because if, you know, it's, it's better to make sure that my stuff's right as opposed to just like blindly trusting my coding capability. And so uh, on Windows 10 specifically, K-List has this field down at the bottom called KDC called. And, uh, and what that is referencing is the uh, key distribution center uh, that the ticket is being requested or being created from, right? And so um, in the K and so we tested this across uh, some production environments. We had a bunch of people on Slack that were offering up their, their enterprise that run some tests for us. And so, uh, Every time there was a forged ticket, this KDC call field was blank. Um, every time that it was a legitimate ticket, the KDC call field was was populated with the actual domain controller that the ticket was granted from. Um, the question that we have is: Is this uh, where did, where did this data come from? How did KList you know get get the KDC that was that was used? Um, and is this information only in KList on Windows? It's only on Windows 10 KList. But is it available outside of KList just through APIs somewhere else on older older uh, operating systems? If it is, I think that that would probably be one of the best behavioral detections that we can that we can have. So a little bit more uh, research to try to figure out where that information came from. All right, and I'll turn it back over for, to Robbie for some parting thoughts. Yeah, so like we talked about at the beginning, kind of the big takeaway first point is don't bite off more than you can chew. It's a lot better to accomplish something um, even if it doesn't feel like a lot at the time, and then look back and realize how far you have come. And so detect golden ticket use specifically is, is a lot better and a lot more achievable than find bad guys as a broad statement. Um, with that being said, there is no golden bullet for golden tickets. So if, if you were to perfectly forge the ticket with the right encryption type in the domain, with the user account for its own name with the right renewal length and everything, it would evade all these detections. So that's where the kind of defense in depth comes into play, where as you're, as you're going across all the different types of techniques, uh, having that breadth of coverage is going to help ensure that even if one or two of those detections aren't working, the more good detections you have, the higher chance of, of detecting the overall flow of the attack. Um, and with that, it's an iterative process. So this is not something that should be a one and done. You should be adjusting your detections as you learn more. Like Jared said, in going through this, the KDC called was something we didn't know about. And so now you can go and reevaluate this at a later date with that new information. Every time you go to a conference talk, you meet with someone else in the field, you're, you're going to likely learn something that's going to help you adjust and make your stuff better. And so using that iterative process to where you're, you're constantly making everything better is going to help. Um, and you're going to be adjusting the detections for your environment. So every environment is different. What is a true positive in one environment is likely a false positive in another. Uh, there's no hard and fast rules. And because all of these things can be changed by admins, and admins do what admins do, you don't know what is going to be normal. Yeah, admins are going to admin. Um, and finally, don't settle for just one detection technique. So as we talked about, uh, this was specifically looking at golden tickets in the local ticket cache. That's what we did here. And there's a lot of really good, valuable things, and this is a lot better than nothing. But you can look at event logs if you have your event logs all enabled and you're logging all the Kerberos events and look for that activity there. And that's another whole potential thing that you could go down. Um, additionally, if you're monitoring network requests and using those network requests and, and monitoring that, like, say, Microsoft ATA, where it's looking at Kerberos traffic, uh, you can identify odd behavior based on the network. So that's another area that, that you could go into that's going to help. So this is kind of our takeaway. It's not perfect, 
Um, but in general, if you're, if you're raising that bar and you're slowly making things better, you're going to look back over time and see how far you've come and see what you've done and then be able to kind of chart where you, you really need and want to go. Uh, so with that, this is all the resources um, for both of Jared's scripts, the test ticket, unit testing, and then the Git Kerberos ticket. Um, Sean Metcalf's awesome post about Kerberos, tick forging the Kerberos tickets, and then the attack matrix specifically referencing that uh, pass the ticket technique. Um, with that, any questions? Yeah, so, uh, like we don't, we don't necessarily have like a formalized like threat intel shop or something along those lines. And so we, we don't really like necessarily get in the like the sticks taxi type religious debate. But, uh, I think gen generally as long as you're sharing, yeah, it, it's beneficial. I, yeah. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I, I don't, I, I can't even guesstimate what that, what that number would be. Um, but like, for instance, uh, like, for, you know, a Andy is a accomplished red teamer and he, he grabbed the NTLM hash, uh, just because it was easier to get than the AES key, right? And so just that little bit of messing up, uh, caused him to, caused him to create that RC4 golden ticket, uh, which would then be detected possibly, right? So, um, if somebody creates a perfectly forged ticket from the perspective of on the host, you, you would then hopefully have some sort of network uh, monitoring to detect where a service ticket was was requested, uh, but no corresponding uh, TGT was requested, right? And that would that would be like kind of the mismatch. So there's as long as you're going from the defense and death perspective, you could start to kind of lower the ability of the adversary to create those perfect situations. Yep, no problem. Anybody else? Yep. So, can you say it again? Yeah, that, uh, that's a good question, and I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, um, I know like the time frames are. I think the log on session type probably is, um, but I, I couldn't definitively tell you off the top of my head. Yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah, so. Uh, PowerShell in general has a unit testing framework called Pester, and so I tried to get Pester working, but I've like I'm, I'm not real good with Pester. And in the time frame, I, it was actually easier for me to write my own version of Pester than it was to actually like get it to do specifically what I was trying to do. Um, but Pester would like at the end give you all the results and say like, oh, 20 tests failed, or like you know 98 passed, or whatever. But yeah, it might be cool to say, hey, this has the signature of a default Mimikatz ticket, for instance. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, Benjamin Delpy might have an opinion of that. Um, and he, he's tweeted about it, so if you're interested, I would, I, yeah, I, I would say ask him because, <laughs> he, he, my god. Yeah, I thought people would get a kick out of that one, so. Uh oh. All right. Yeah. 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 Possibly. Yeah. I mean, actually, yeah. I'm. I, I'm not going to. I don't know if I'm still on camera, so I'm not going to say anything about that. <laughs> yep. Any other last questions? Cool. Awesome. Thanks. A yeah. Lot. Oh, we'll, we'll talk to you after. Yep. Thanks, guys.